Good evening, uh, Professor Andrew Lane the, from the University of Leicester, um, originally from Liverpool and studied and worked in Cambridge before spending a decade in California and moving to Leicester in 2010. He was also a science team member on the NASA Wide Field Infrared Space Explorer, that's the WISE mission, that was launched in 2009 and he's been involved in the time allocation process for several ground-based millimeter far infrared telescopes and the JCMT, IRAM and the ALMA, ALMA. He was chair of the ALMA Science Advisory Committee in 2010 and the, OK, and the UK, sorry, <laughs> oversight board for the SKA project. He's got many publications um, he teaches various topics at the university, galaxy evolution, fundamental particles, um, optic modules, modern physics, and undergraduate reading and research projects. He's interested in the formation and evolution of galaxies, especially from an infrared perspective, probing the interstellar medium to account for the complete luminosity of galaxies. This involves using a range of optical through radio observing facilities, both from the ground and in space. He also has an interest in the use and details of gravitational lensing, again focused mainly on its effects on infrared sources. His prime interest at present is investigating the nature of the ultra-luminous ultra -luminous galaxies that have been discovered over the whole sky using the WISE mission and the opportunities of extremely high quality sensitive imaging using the ALMA telescope which is now in service in northern Chile. So can you please put your hands together and give them a mix for an Swinton astronomy welcome to Professor Andrew Blake. If you'd like to share your screen Andrew. Yeah great thank you very much. Um, so now I, I'm not that familiar with doing presentations to groups like this online. I've done, you know, I haven't done any like this since our, uh, you know, situation changed. Um, and so please feel free to interrupt and ask uh, in, in, during the, the talk if you have anything you'd like to uh, clarify. Um, and also, you know, it, 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 you know, if you want to know more about something which I'm mentioning. Um, I've got quite a lot of material and I'll try and stick to, to fit a, a narrative and um, fit what you guys might like to, to hear. So please feel free to, um, to, to chat during the uh, process. And um, Roy said I think he'd um, compare and, and, and compile questions if there is anything to, uh, um, to put to me while, while the talk goes on. Uh, and also, um, you know, feel please feel free to uh, you know shout and make things uh, known if you can't hear or anything goes wrong with the um, with the presentation. So uh, let me go to the share, and it should bring up the presentation slide again. Does that look okay for everybody? That's fine. I can see. Um, I think I'm going to get rid of the. I think I can get rid of that window with the uh, um, with the thing. So I think that's now the pictures that I'd like you to see. Um, so I, I'm very glad to be able to come and talk to you today. Um, and I'm going to tell you some of the things that I've been doing in the last uh, well, I guess decade or so really now, um, based upon this, uh, this mission WISE, which was a, an all sky survey um, that NASA started supporting in 2001. And it flew in 2009. Um, did an all sky survey in six months and then continued to, to operate and it's still up there, still taking data looking for near Earth uh, objects, so potentially Earth threatening asteroids. That's not what I'm interested in primarily, but um, alongside that was a key goal of the, um, of the mission, which was designed to find the most luminous galaxy, absolutely without any qualifications, you know, the, the bright, you know, the, the most powerful galaxy that is out there. Um, the nearest star 
and potentially damaging asteroids that cross the Earth's orbit. And um, it was able to do those things because it was uh, looking in a band uh, in the infrared where those objects are relatively brighter and which it's more difficult to gather data. And so only by the technology improving is it possible to, to have done that. Um, so the, the opening pictures here are sort of a, a montage of some of that, that process. Um, WISE itself there is in the top left in the clean room at Ball Aerospace in, uh, in Boulder, Colorado. And it's approximately twice as far away from the camera as I am standing there in the, uh, in the protective suit. So the, uh, it's not a very large spacecraft by spacecraft standards, but it's certainly, you know, it's three or four meters tall. Um, and the telescope is actually inside the white section top there. And it looks out, in this case, in the vertical direction. The detectors are inside that um, white bulbous uh, region. I'll try and move my mouse to that part and circle it gently without making you sick. Um, so that was where the telescope, a 40 centimeter aperture telescope, gold, uh, gold mirrors coming down onto uh, infrared detectors. And it was designed with the spacecraft beneath it to give an all sky survey. Um, the picture in the middle is it on its way up from the coast of California into a polar orbit. Um, and then the other two pictures, the top right is the summit of Mauna Kea um, with some of the telescopes we've used to find the, more about the things wise highlighted for us. And then below part of the ALMA telescope in Chile, which we've also used to dissect and try to find out more about the objects that WISE has, has picked. Um, so I'm going to move on to the... Am I? Hang on. Ah. Okay, no, that's working. So I'm going to tell, tell you about these very luminous objects. Um, and typically, I'm going to sort of implicitly have them as active galactic nuclei. So the things I'm going to be telling you about WISE finding are almost certainly powered by uh, mass falling into a very large black hole in the center of the galaxy and doing it at the rate um, producing power about a thousand times greater than an ordinary galaxy. So it's pretty a very special time during the galaxy's history. Um, and by highlighting that special time, we can perhaps find out about the process that guides and forms galaxies as a whole. And many of these objects um, are covered by the interstellar medium, um, dust and gas, and, uh, which makes it difficult to see them at optical wavelengths. And it's necessary to go to the longer wavelengths in the infrared, where the uh, material is less opaque and emits more light, to get a, both a, a picture of the, um, get a better idea of the total power they're producing, and to see things you just can't look at with visible light because the um, what's effectively like smoke in the interstellar medium, the um, uh, cosmic dust that forms in the atmospheres of evolved stars in the wind as it cools, is rather like diesel soot. Um, that just makes the optical photons, it absorbs them, heats up, and then re-radiates in the infrared. So it's like, uh, they're like little radiators uh, heated by absorbing um, the optical light. And that amount of energy is faithfully reproduced. If you look in the infrared, you can find out the total amount of energy being produced, including the stuff that you can't see directly with optical light. And if you go all the way from the ultraviolet to the radio and sum up all the total power, um, then you get a better idea of what's going on in these objects. And um, by looking in this, in, in the infrared, you're also able to see what's happening right in the center where most of the energy is coming out in these active galaxies. Um, the energy is being produced around the black hole in a region that's not dramatically bigger than the sort of separation of typical stars in the galaxy. So much, much smaller than the whole galaxy. And so you can't see it directly and, and reveal internal structure, but by looking at the um, light it produces, you can get a sense of what must be happening in there. So I hope that gives you some motivation for why um, we're looking at these things. Uh, and so the things I'm going to be telling you about have been highlighted in that in this way using WISE. 
and that's going to be some of the processes that are at work uh, in there. So this uh, is a montage of Wise's uh, progress. Um, and I said about it being in a polar orbit, and that, that's necessary because it has to cover the whole sky. Um, it was in a relatively low Earth orbit, 400 kilometers up, and it looks out constantly, so it rotates gently once an orbit, and it tiles the sky in about a degree strip. So the telescope moves um, steadily, and it takes frames in a kind of a, a tartan pattern, covering about 15 stripes a day, covering about a degree, and then it'll move around a degree the next day. Uh, and the plane of its orbit's always arranged so that it's um, 90 degrees away from the, from the sun. It's over the day-night boundary. So it can always look out <coughs> 90 degrees away from the sun. And then every now and again, it has to watch out for the moon as well every month because it can't look at the moon either. And um, so that causes the, the, the overall sky coverage, which is shown at the bottom, um, the bottom right, has hefty coverage in the direction of the poles and a minimum on the equator. But overall, uh, the coverage is still enough to make a whole sky picture, which um, provides an alternative view uh, to what we'd see if we were looking at optical light. And it's still taking data, looking for, um, looking for Earth crossing asteroids in the two shortest bands. It's got four, it had four bands at three, four, 12 and 24 microns. So ranging from about three or four times longer than optical uh, light out to a, a factor that's 20 times longer, um, corresponding to lower temperature cooler objects. And it reached sensitivities about a factor 30 deeper than the previous uh, mission that had covered the whole sky. Uh, and you can, you can sort of see that in this plot up here at the top right, um, showing why is in terms of a sensitivity which is in a in log units so um they're you know two and a half of astronomical magnitudes each um tick mark um so a factor of 10 fainter for each of the mark numbers on the on the y-axis um, and so previously the iras mission was approximately you know a hundred times less sensitive than Y, so it was able to go much deeper than previous uh, previous missions and find a whole slew uh, of extra extra objects. And um, this was enabled basically by the ability to make uh, detectors up here at the top left. Um, this object is a, a two thousand square um, equivalent to a um, optical detector in a camera, but for infrared radiation. Uh, and previously, you know, only 30 years ago, you had a single pixel. And these are now producing imaging detectors. And that's the crucial step to allow us to cover the whole sky, um, sky uh, quickly and efficiently. And so that's just building up bits and pieces of the instrument uh, until it was actually in the last picture on the right, was the last time it was seen when it was going into its uh, um, launch fairing before it was. Uh, it was sent into space. And um, although WISE is uh, an infrared telescope, it does produce these, these images. Um, and you can see things which look a little different than they do in the optical, but are kind of striking in, in themselves. Um, the picture on the left shows the Fornax cluster, which is a nearby cluster of galaxies. Um, and to, to WISE, though, the colors in WISE are representing the, uh, the infrared band. So, it's a kind of a false color, but um, you can see everything's blue. And that reflects the fact that uh, when you look in the infrared for regular stars, they, they're black body spectra and they get fainter as you go to longer wavelengths. Um, so they peak visually a particular color, but when you go to longer wavelengths, they all have the same sort of slope. And so no matter what sort of galaxy you're looking at there in the cluster, they've all got this blue color. And that also is, equivalent on the other side, the M31 picture, uh, five square degrees around our nearest uh, big galactic neighbor. And you can see the blue color uh, in the center where the old stars are congregated. Again, the same factor that we're looking at less power from the, the longer wavelengths. But in addition, you can see a red ring around M31. And that's powerful emission from dust from the interstellar medium where there are more young stars. 
So that's energy which you can't see very clearly in the optical, but which is being picked up by the uh, interstellar medium and, and transferred to wavelengths that WISE uh, can detect. So it's highlighting regions of the galaxy where there's strong activity. And you can see in Fornax as well, there's a, there's a yellow object um, down to the bottom uh, right there. And that's a galaxy where there's active uh, young stars being formed and heating the dust uh, to, to appear to its wise. And just to give an idea about the scale here, the, the, the white, the white um, circle on the left is the, the full moon on that scale um, for the Fornax picture. And M31, that frame's four times bigger, but just shrunk to fit onto the same screen. So it does produce kind of visually compelling images uh, as well um, over the whole sky. And you can go to the uh, WISE website at, uh, uh, at IPAC in, uh, in California and, and you know, look at your favorite objects. Uh, it will produce for you, a, um, you know, an infrared WISE picture of you know, a chosen part of the sky. And so um, that, that gives us a picture of some things which uh, are more uh, are not particularly dramatic with WISE, but um, this, this picture now shows the, uh, the more active objects that we can see more clearly. Um, M81 and M82 at the bottom here are a pair of famous nearby galaxies, but um, by virtue of using the infrared, M82 shines out much more brightly to WISE in that golden um, emission. And IC342 is a nearby, not very powerful active galactic nucleus where there's a black hole fueling. And you can see here that in the three wise colors going from the short to long wavelengths, as you go to the longer wavelengths, the central object becomes clearer and it gets brighter to wise. Um, and so if you scale this up, from from this relatively um, weak example of an active galactic nucleus to a much more powerful one where mass is falling into the black hole at a much greater rate, that process continues and WISE can, can still see the, uh, can, can get in to see the emission from the central object, which optical pictures just don't highlight that it's lurking behind too much dust. So, um, I don't know if any, is everybody happy with, uh, with things so far? Are there any questions or any, uh, any comments? I think we're going for about 20 minutes. So I thought I'd just give you a chance to um, see if we're doing okay. I have no questions on the chat. So I, th I think you're doing fine. Great. Okay. Well, you know, feel free to uh, you know, keep, keep a note and we'll add, questions at the end is fine, but don't, don't uh, you know, uh, very happy to answer them as we go. So, um, so that, that's a sort of overview a little of what WISE did, making this whole sky sensitive survey. Um, but then once we've got those images, the question is how do we use them to highlight things that uh, I'm you know, particularly interested in here, these most luminous galaxies, examples where those active galactic nuclei are taken to the extreme. Not just- Oh, sorry, here. Andrew, we've had a question. What does SED stand for? Ah. Um, haven't really, it, it went by, I think. I didn't need to give it to you. Uh, spectral energy distribution. It basically tells you about where the energy comes in different bands. Um, perhaps that was on the picture of, oh, that's right. It was the WISE, you know, depth sensitivity demonstration. So SED is spectral energy distribution. It tells you where the power emitted by an object appears, um, whether it's at optical or infrared or other wavelengths. Um, that I'll, let's if that needs recapping at the end then please feel free there um so uh for, for how to identify things with wise though it's got four color four color bands so you can take the difference in um in the color uh between those bands and different objects produce different um different colors uh as highlighted by the picture most clearly here um and this was done before wise blue today what we might see for different objects and it compares up here on the y-axis the two shorter uh, band observations from wise uh, with the difference between the power um, where again we've got we've got astronomical magnitudes here so 
a factor of five here is a factor of a hundred in power. Um, and then the second band versus a longer band on the x-axis. And because different galaxies and different objects have got um, the, their, their distribution of energy between different wavelengths is different, they appear in different places. And um, stars which were blue in those visual images all cluster around the zero zero point in this um, description. And as you go to include more dust in between the stars and the galaxy, you tend to shift things over to the um, right. The first thing that affects it is to the longer wavelength. So you're moving in that axis without changing much in this one. So the shorter wavelengths don't change too much, but you add in the longer wavelength contribution and that moves you uh, from the stars, oops, uh, the stars position to these LURGs, which are luminous infrared galaxies, which are galaxies that have got more uh, dust than the typical uh, and spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies are, are closer to the star position. Then if you're looking for extreme objects, when you start uh, adding even more interstellar medium, they move up this diagram. And so here, the potential regions, we can find very highly luminous objects and standard uh, active galaxies, the QSOs with a, a creating uh, black hole in the center moves you up into this region. And so what we were able to do, having got the catalog from WISE, is look in the regions up here. Well, I've lost my pointer, lost track of where I put the, uh, there we go. So uh, sort of the region I'm circling here, about four, two in this diagram is where the rarest things can be found. And so by looking over the whole catalog, identifying those galaxies, and then going looking for them at other wavelengths, to try to identify which ones they are, then we were able to start studying the, the properties of the, what these things were doing. And by making these color cuts, um, we were able to deploy big telescopes to uh, take spectra to find out the redshift of those objects and to try to find out some of the astrophysics of the contents um, without accidentally bumping into any stars, which is the downside. You don't want to use your large telescope uh, and end up confirming that you've misplaced a, uh, a, a, a diagnosis and are actually just looking at a faint red star. Um, I only found one faint red star when I was at the VLT following these things up. So we, we took about 50 good quality spectra and found only one star. And that 2% is reflected in the much larger effort to identify things in the survey too. So we've got now a sample of very luminous objects. Um, and this, is sim this picture just simply shows how this could be put in the context of the picture of galaxy evolution. Um, and so we're just trying to find out from WISE where the most dramatic things are happening, and try and find out why they're dramatic at that point. So these, I'm not gonna go into in detail about these pictures, but we're just here trying to identify places that, um, that the, the most remarkable things are happening in a galaxy's history. And perhaps it's to do with the environment, the surroundings, or something about perhaps they've merged, uh, or they're found in a particular type of object that's formed in a particular way. Um, and by probing the objects that WISE highlights, we're able to start getting insight into that sort of process. Uh, and so the thing to, I mean, overall, hopefully, if you want to look back over the record over the recording as well, you see the the pictures that. The history of the universe, we're probing all the way back to the first stars in principle with WISE. You could see a very luminous object a long way back in the infrared. Uh, and then we can put that in the context of the results of simulations where people expect to find galaxies in certain environments. You can see them painted on top of a, of a simulation of dark matter gravitating together there and um, try to understand more about what's, what's driving that, those processes. And um, this is a, and this is less of a cartoon, but this is one of the first pictures that we produced back 25 years ago now from a telescope in Britain, uh, no, in Hawaii, but operated by Britain, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, uh, where we were able to find dust enshrouded galaxies in very small fields in the sky um, and show that they evolved really, really strongly. Um, the, the picture is going on the left from the present day when redshift is 
zero out to redshift here of about six back when the universe was what ten percent of its present age, and the the peak is giving us a um, demonstration of how much power is being produced in galaxies as a whole, which was based on these long wavelength infrared observations, but only over a small patch of sky. And um, the thing to note is that back when the redshift, the universe is about half its present age, um, the activity was about a factor of 20 or 30 higher. And so it was a much more dramatic um, environment back then. And so uh, whereas looking at, um, we can see that there's been strong evolution in the uh, production of light in galaxies. And that's mirrored pretty closely in whether you're forming stars and burning hydrogen or whether you're fueling AGM. They seem to go together. Um, and the most powerful uh, release of gravitational energy as mass falls into black holes it seems to happen around the same time as the most stars form. Uh, and potentially that can be telling us about how the contents of a galaxy changes with time and that the same process that can allow gas to collapse to form stars can also drive gas towards the center and interact with the black hole. Um, but without knowing where these things are and finding examples, it's not easy to address these questions. So by doing the, the overall uh, sampling of the, the demographics of galaxies with WISE, we can then zoom in and find out bit more about what's going on. And um, this is also a picture which is a, a, perhaps a nice demonstration of this um, the, the spectral energy distribution argument. It shows the same galaxy, a pair of merging objects close by the, the antennae, I think uh, NGC 4038 and 9, um, showing different bands all the way from the long wavelength infrared to the which is, which is in the center at 350 microns, the optical from the Hubble uh, and, um, and X-ray pictures as well, highlighting different processes in the same galaxies. And um, the thing that Wise was able to show and, and Spitzer and, and ISO previously was that what you see in the optical is only a fraction of the total. You need to go to longer wavelengths in order to find, in particular this hot spot here, which is where most of the power is coming from, is relatively dark in the uh, optical picture from Hubble, because that's where the dust and gas are densest and absorbing the optical light. So there's lots of power coming out, but you can't see it directly. And this is built up even more in the extreme objects that WISE found out at greater distances, where we're looking at objects which are only 1% of their powers coming out in the visible. And so you have to take a full account of everything, including the infrared. But the, the downside of this here is that all of this structure at great distances is all down on a scale of about an arc second in size. And WISE didn't have the resolving power and the size of, um, size of uh, aperture required to get inside these objects. And this is why we need to follow up with large ground-based telescopes and the forthcoming Webb um, Space Telescope and the ALMA interferometer, which can get inside galaxies and find out about what's taking place uh, within. Um, and so this is, a, this is just a, a graphical explanation of the same thing. We're running from different wavelengths and frequencies showing the peak of emission being found at different locations. And this is, this is the picture that tells you about the, uh, the object which is responsible for that peak curve. This is just to summarize, really, if you run from the optical on the right through the infrared for Ys here, through to longer wavelengths that ALMA probes, you can see that the peak of the power of a galaxy comes out at around 100 microns, a factor of about 100 longer in wavelengths than optical light, um, which the Milky Way does too. Um, and then there's a whole pile of spectral lines, which can tell you interesting things about the gas motion. Um, uh, visible in this band as well. Once you know where to look and the redshift at which you should tune your, uh, tune your telescope. And so this is kind of a uh, motivation for why ALMA is very useful because it can dig into the emission from the interstellar medium and find out about the astrophysics of the gas, its temperature, its pressure, um, motion, uh, and from that, the total mass involved 
from working out the, uh, how, how the orbits are working in the gas. Um, and so that, that just, again, another emphasis of the number of, if you're going from the optical over here, a fact of a hundred times more power might be coming out uh, if you know where to highlight it using the, the infrared approach. This one's kind of a, let's go past that. Um, and now talk about the wise things. Um, these are similar diagrams showing power as a function of wavelength, um, but highlighting things that wise found. Now the picture to the top left was a kind of a pre, um, largely what we expected to see prior to wise flying. We're running from optical wavelengths over here to a hundred microns, we expected it to rise up and peak at a few hundred microns. Whereas in fact, WISE was able to see a whole class of new things that hadn't really been appreciated before. Um, the picture at the bottom uh, left is one of the first um, plots showing the spectral energy distribution of the WISE objects. Um, and they're there in the blue uh, lines. In that if you look at longer wavelengths, they're much less powerful than those templates would suggest. So most of the power is coming out at 10 microns. And the temperature associated with that shorter wavelength is higher. And so they were called hot dogs. Um, for hot, because the dust is really several hundred degrees uh, Kelvin, whereas the Milky Way is dust about 20 Kelvin. And dogs for dust obscure galaxies, which was something that found by the Spitzer telescope and popularized that expression and, and hot dogs um, became the slang term to describe very luminous objects picked by wise but which have this very um, short infrared peak at around 10 microns meaning that the, the the energy was being dumped into dust in the interstellar medium that was really quite hot um, only 10 times cooler than the surface of the star whereas the typical emission at 100 microns is down by a factor of several hundred from the surface of the star. So that it's being really heated intensely and um, we weren't expecting to find things that look like this. So it's a good example of going looking for the right things and finding something new and exciting. Um, and this is the, the, uh, the combination of a whole array of different approaches to, to tracking these things, finding them, looking at them, finding their distance. So there's a whole pile of different observations going to producing this diagram to, to highlight what these hot dogs look like, um, objects which were just not known prior uh, to wise flying, largely because they're rare. There's only a few thousand of them over the whole sky. It's really difficult to bump into them by accident. And it's only by covering the whole sky that you find them. And you find the most extreme locations and the places where things are doing the, uh, the most dramatic activities. Um, and uh, this is sort of a, uh, it's a standard cartoon of how the energy is being produced here, um, which just shows, uh, um, I, I'm not going to talk about this in detail because um, it's a very generic picture. Uh, and basically it just means that if material flows into a black hole, it has to go into a smaller scale and it tends to spin up if it's got any rotation and that tends to make a disc. Uh, and you also have to get the stuff into the center um, because it'll just orbit otherwise, you've got to slow it down. And so you need a disc to have viscosity and transfer motion from the inside to the outside so that it can slow down and fall in. And so this is basically a cartoon of what we think the wise objects are. There's this very hot, very small region where gas is shearing around spinning down into, into its gravitational energy. And it's doing it at a level which is up to 30% of its uh, mc squared energy of Einstein. Um, nuclear fusion can produce about um, one part in 200 of that energy. So stars, although very powerful, are about 100 times less efficient than AGN at making, at making energy. So let's kind of count for why uh, the wise discovered things can be so powerful, many, uh, you know, many thousands of times more luminous than the typical galaxy.
And it's all coming from this inner region around the black hole where the material is being heated by falling in and releasing its gravitational energy. And then the surrounding material, we see the effect of it, this energy being dumped into the gas and dust. And we can see that uh, first with wise and then with follow-up instruments. Um, and so there's a variety of things you can probe, um, which we're going to go into in any particular uh, great detail. But we all, again, we're just to try and emphasize you get a, a rich variety of astrophysics that you can, you can probe. Now, this picture then shows an example of one of this, the first hot dog that was identified with uh, a luminosity uh, in 10 to the 14 times more than the sun, so about a thousand times brighter than a typical galaxy. And it shows often what you find when you start to investigate, things get a little complicated in that um, we've got at the top left, a picture taken from the Keck 10 meter telescope in Hawaii of the region that we knew WISE was emitting at, but the WISE picture had the resolution of that large blob to the bottom left. So you couldn't split up which of the optical objects that were found were the ones producing the emission. Um, and it turns out that if you use a telescope, which is in France here, the Platte de Bure Interferometer, which is like ALMA, you can actually highlight that the cross is the, it, you know, X marks the spot there, and most of the power in this nasty uh, color scheme is coming from that object, which is here. Um, and characteristically, I think B is actually a small star, just to confuse things. You often find that uh, when you're finding a bunch of interesting objects, you know, some of them are not as interesting as you expected and just unfortunately co-located. But we can certainly see that there's interacting objects at the same distance um, and that one of them is dominating the, the power that's being produced. So it's a complex object um, and one which, you know, this, it's unambiguous that it's really, really powerful, um, but it's not clear how the interaction of the different components is driving this great luminosity. And we need to, again, continue to dig in to find internal details to get to that point. Um, that's also another SED picture, which is probably not ideal to discuss uh, at this point because it's um, it's just a, it's some of the same things I've already said. Now I'm going to show you the final thing I think I'm going to have uh, time to show is what we've done with ALMA, which is a, a quite different instrument, but it has a great um, capability to image exactly the things we're looking at. And it was perhaps the thing the first it genuinely genuinely equal international partnership. In astronomy, usually one group of countries or organizations will propose something and others may join, but ALMA was international. There were two projects, one in Europe, one in the US, which merged together um, to produce an a sort of equal partnership from those two blocks and then with a slightly smaller contribution from East Asia as well. Um, and it cost, I think, overall about one and a half billion dollars. So it's a ground-based telescope that costs as much as a space mission. It's located at a spectacular plateau, uh, five kilometers above sea level. It's about 15 kilometers on a side, um, on the sort of point where Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile come together. It's a really remarkable place. Um, it's a whole huge volcanic structure. Um, and it's currently got an active volcano, I think Lascar, which is over there on the picture. It's one of those dangerous volcanoes in Chile, apart from the fact nobody lives near it. So it's a gently explosive volcano. Alma, fortunately, is upslope from it though. So if it produced anything, it would flow away from Alma. Um, but it is a really spectacular place. And it's unusual, it's very dry, it's very high in the Atacama Desert. Um, so most of the atmosphere is uh, below you anyway. And then, most of the water vapor is either absent or lower. So it gives great transparency to these infrared wavelengths. Uh, not nearly as transparent as being in space, but you can't put a big telescope in space of this scale uh, very easily. Uh, and the great thing about a flat plateau is that 15 kilometers allows you to add together the signals from radio telescopes to mimic the effect of a 15 kilometer aperture, which gives you the resolution precision of the pictures you need to try to pick apart these objects. 
Zalm as a, a quite a powerful uh, device. Um, it basically looks like a, a radio telescope, but it's working at very short radio wave events merging into the infrared. Um, and it's got, uh, again, whole piles of technology with, without which it wouldn't be possible. And it wouldn't have been possible to do it more than you know, a decade or, or so ago with fiber optics and computing power to make the images. So um, this is an ALMA picture of WISE's most luminous galaxy. It was identified uh, by WISE uh, and it was looked at with ALMA um, and we were able to see, although the WISE picture had about a four arc second resolution, we can see that the, wise, the, the ALMA image here is producing a dense size thing about 0.2 arc seconds across. So we're getting to know where the exact location of the powerful emission is. And you can also see other objects from ALMA associated with it on scales that are spread around the extent of the galaxy. And we can see that the dust and the gas are slightly separated on different scales. And so we're able to probe different patches using the, uh, um, using, the using ALMA's power to uh, see where the gas and where the dust are associated. Um, so, oh, sorry. No. yeah. So um, this is. I don't want to focus on too much of the detail here, but it's just emphasised that not just the we don't just get the total power from Alma. We actually see how the gas is moving around, and this lets us see potentially how it's falling into the black hole. Um, and one thing we have found from this is if we look at the the Doppler section, is showing you that the speed of the, uh, of the gas associated with ALMA's observations um, gives you that it's pretty much uniform over the object. Galaxies tend to move at a few hundred kilometers a second. And here, we're not seeing a very strong change in speed across. It's only over like 100 or so in range. But the width of the line is really powerful. It's 400, 500 kilometers a second. So, that means that the gas is moving quickly and it's hot. Um, so it's a small region with gas that's uniform but hot. Um, and I think the best analogy I like for this is if you remember back to Roadrunner cartoons, if Wile Wiley Coyote swallowed dynamite and it went off, his eyes would bulge. And he'd clearly be in a state of uh, uh, non, he wasn't going to be stable like that. But at the point of ignition, you get this really hot gas that's really small and it's going to expand, but it hasn't yet. It's all contained um, within his clenched teeth. And I think this is exactly what these Alma hot dogs are doing. They are, if you came back to them in half a million years, you'd see gas out flowing powerfully in all directions, but we're just watching them at the point that they've gone off, but it's still all trapped inside. Um, so this is some of the uh, you know, the, the most recent results we've been able to get by picking apart the, the contents of uh, the WISE discovered galaxies using ALMA. And the Webb telescope is going to fly soon where we've got some time to continue this process and dig into the infrared appearance on, on smaller scales uh, by using the larger capacity of the, of the Webb Space Telescope. So I think I've got to, to about 45 minutes um, and I think I've told you some things which I was aiming to. Let me just have a quick flick through in case there's anything else. These tend to be a little more um, focused on, yeah, no, that's all kind of going over the same thing again to some degree. Um, and I think um, I would just go to my sort of final. This is actually something I, yeah, let's just say this before I finish. Um, Carrie Bridge was a postdoc with me when we were doing follow-up work uh, in California for, for WISE. And, and she actually found a way to highlight another weird class of objects amongst the WISE galaxies called Lyman Alpha Blobs. And these are big um, sort of 100 kiloparsec scale regions where ionized gas has been excited by some dramatic activity. And actually, despite these things being ultraviolet, Lyman Alpha is an ultraviolet uh, signature, the wise colors in the infrared allowed you to pre-select them and find these large halos of uh, powerful emission, which was kind of interesting. And actually, Carrie 
uh, went on. To, she's currently in the operations team for the for the Mars rovers, uh, and so she's changed scales dramatically from the whole universe to our one of our nearest neighbours. But um, but she was able to identify this special technique of finding blobs, which otherwise are really rare. Finding them in alpha blobs is difficult. Uh, only a few tens of them were known, and then Wise was able to find them in a kind of a back backdoor route. Um, and then just finally to uh, show that one of the graduate students in in um, in, in uh, Leicester, uh, Susie Jones, took pictures with the James Clark Maxwell Telescope on, in Hawaii, which was the first thing to really emphasize how important dusty galaxies were. And and she actually found that there's when you look around a wise object, you see about ten times too many other things producing long wavelength emission. And it's difficult to see this from WISE because these things are fainter than WISE can see because uh, this is digging down into a particular patch. Um, but it, it does look like the most extreme WISE things are highlighting areas of the universe where there's lots of other activity going on as well. And this is something which we can hopefully get more from the Webb telescope as it comes up to cover these approximately arc minute scales pictures of the regions around the uh, around the hot dogs. Um, so I think I will just run through to sort of a summary and then ask for questions. Uh, I think I went perhaps five minutes over, but um, hopefully and the importance of uh, infrared observations and the technology that enables them as we uh, you know, we continue to learn more about galaxy evolution. Thanks. Okay. So, has anybody got any questions for Andrew? Uh, wave your hands or put it on chat. I'm looking around for anybody waving their hands. At least one hand. Uh, Peter Lloyd. <laughs> well, nobody else is going to start. Um, yes, yeah, thank you for that talk, Andrew. Um, I, I just wanted to go back to the picture you showed of IC342. Um, yeah, let I, me try. I, oh, I'll can you? I think so. Uh, can you still see this? It's yes. still shared, right? Yeah. Uh, I'll just try and do it manually, just spinning through. Well, it, it was fairly early on, I'm afraid. I don't want to. I don't want to come out of sharing the. Oh, there we um, go. Yes, there we go. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to risk coming out of screen sharing and losing everything. So, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, there we go. I, I notice in the red image, there's what looks very much like diffraction spikes, but they don't appear in the other two. Yeah. And I just wonder whether there's something more interesting yeah. than diffraction spikes. No, it is diffraction spikes, um, and that's just. That's just because the the longer wavelength um, performance is more prone to artifacts because the the resolution of the instrument is worse. I mean, if you're running at twelve microns, then the uh, the resolu intrinsic resolution of the telescope is less than it is at three. But but the main reason it's visible there is just like you would with a with a bright star in a in an astrophotography image. Unless the uh, unless the thing is so bright and intense, it, it, you can't get the diffraction spikes. So this basically means that the um, you're seeing the spikes as a visual feature that attracts your attention, but what it's actually showing you is just how bright that central red. Yeah, spot I, I is. did notice that the, the, the central spot was a lot brighter in that image than the other two. Oh, good. I'm, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that that main thing for the for the spike. I mean, I think the diffraction performance of the other bands is rather similar, but the red core is brighter, so you do get the effect. Right, thank you. Catherine, you've got a question. I've always got a question. You've uh, uh, picked up some Doppler shifts. Have you picked up any gravitational mm -hmm. red shifts? Um, <laughs> no, because th that has to be that would have to be really close to the black oh, yeah. hole and we're seeing stuff that's spread around through the galaxy and absorbing the total power 
Um, to do that, you'd have to look for x-rays, which are coming from right in the center. Um, so we're looking at the uh, spread of speeds associated with the uh, either the potential in which the gas is sitting or its recently excited physical state where it's been moved compared with that. But on a scale of the sort of the whole galaxy rather yeah, than yeah. the very central most region. Although we're getting the energy coming out from the very center, we're actually seeing its effects on scales that are, um, you know, kiloparsecs in size, but sort of on a galactic yeah. scale. Thank you. Uh, on chat, we've uh, got. So, a... yeah, let me... Go ahead, sorry. On chat, we've got a question from uh, Michael Poxton. Um, inside our own galaxies, any results from WISE on primordial and debris disks around young stars? Um, uh, let's see. I think um, there are some, but WISE is not ideally placed to look into regions where young star formation is taking place because they tend to be very, um, uh, you know, very densely packed and covered with other sources. So there's confusion effects, the noise levels raised by having lots of other things to see. Um, but there certainly have been um, better pictures of the surroundings of young star forming regions from from WISE. Um, there was, however, a, a galactic plane survey done by the Spitzer telescope. And Spitzer has the advantage of being a larger telescope and also being point, you could point for a chosen period at where you wanted to see with Spitzer, whereas WISE just gave you the all sky coverage. And so I think if you wanted to know about recent discoveries from infrared observations of young star forming regions it basically came from the glimpse coverage from spitzer which uh, was tailored to do the right thing whereas wise was trawling the whole sky for stars that are close galaxies that are distant and asteroids that are closer still um, giving a uniform coverage but not focusing on the on regions of interest specifically so i think its impact in terms of uh, star forming regions is probably less significant than the tailored approach that um, that Spitzer took to look in specifically in regions where young stars were known to be at the, at the appropriate depth and for the appropriate time to be able to answer those questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Peter Jelowitsa. Hi. Hi. Uh really enjoyed uh, your uh, lecture. Um, I'm from Experience International Astronomical Society. It's not so much uh, a question, but just a, a comment. I've actually uh, used the uh, WISE data, all WISE data uh, in uh, the Vizio database to, for the detection of brown dwarfs. Uh -huh. And uh, very often I found that the very uh, brown dwarfs can be very deep in the infrared, which can sometimes be con uh, confused with active galactic nuclei. I mean, the only difference, uh, one of the differences is obviously that brown dwarfs have motion, whereas the active galactic nuclei uh, with uh, being very deep in the infrared don't. So I found that and... Uh, uh -huh. uh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, brown dwarfs was a key driver for, um, for, for WISE to be as it was. If I actually, I think I'm nearly in the right place to, to go back to the the bands here. Um, the, the, where I've put the cursor now shows the profile of the wise bands. Um, and the careful design of the interface between the band one and band two was chosen so that um, the methane absorption you expect in brown dwarfs appears in only one of them. And so they've got very pronounced colors in bands one and two. And um, so that so they, they may appear in the catalog, but their color um, yeah. can be used to separate them from other other candidates. And so like I was saying that um, by being careful, we avoid bumping into stars in our search for um, search for ultraluminous galaxies, the brown dwarf people 
uh, can avoid bumping into galaxies by looking for this characteristic um, color in the bands one and two, um, mm -hmm. which did allow them to find, uh, you know, things reasonably efficiently like that. Yeah. When I started off, I sort of used as a template in the script get Al paper, where, you, for example, have different templates like J minus H, H minus K, K minus double one, W one. Uh, that I think mm -hmm. presumably that corresponds to the uh, well responses you've got here. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, these are the, these are just the wise bands. Those other things you were mentioning were going to be out at the in the, the one point six to to point eight micron range. Um, which does add, you, know, you can certainly identify different stellar types like that, but the the wise goal was to make sure that these two filters for this particular W1, W2 color was uh, best set to uh, be able to identify um, brown dwarfs which are cool enough to have methane in the atmosphere, yeah. which absorbs one band, not the other. I don't know whether they were actually the the other thing I showed about the the, the color picture, because um, this is all aimed at um, this is all aimed at only uh, the identification of galaxies, um, but I think one down there there's there's one of these has got brown. There you go, T dwarfs. Yeah, that's the region you expect to find brown dwarfs in, um, and that's the extremely red in that color. So it's up in this region. The only things you'd find in there would be brown dwarfs. And that was that was used by um, 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 oh, um, Kirkpatrick et al to, to make the identification of a bunch of brown dwarfs from the wise. David Kirkpatrick, yeah. Thank you very much. We have a question online from William Scutcher. Um, he's written, is it possible to say anything about the polarization of the infrared? And if so, does it tell us anything useful? Um, thermal emission isn't usually polarized. Um, however, dust orientates to magnetic fields and scattered light from dust uh, so if you scatter optical light from dust rather than absorb it, um, that can carry polarization. And that can tell you about the orientation of the fields and about actually, the, in principle, you may also find that the emission initially is polarized because it's coming from fast moving material, which is aligned with a, with a jet leaving a, an object. And so you can, in principle, uh, do, do um, polarimetry on these things. But the actual wise emission itself, identifying the uh, 12 and 23 micron emissions is probably not polarized because it's, um, it's just sort of thermal motion of particles, which doesn't um, matter about the orientation they have. Um, but there have certainly been some polarization measurements of the light from AGN, which tells you um, important information about how the absorption is taking place, because it can be from aligned grains or not. If they're aligned, you get some polarization. But it's very difficult to make sensitive polarization observations. So it's something which only is only a few experts do it. Um, and so it's a it's a tantalizing thing that would be powerful, but uh, it, it's a the specialist area of the moment still. Have we any other questions? Uh, anybody waving a hand? Uh, Anthony Hood. Like to unmute yourself, Tony? Yeah, uh, could you tell me about these uh, gold mirrors? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just that infrared radiation is better reflected by gold. Than by other um, right. material, and the issue that gold is yellow doesn't matter in the infrared. Um, so it, it's it's just the best reflective material. The the Webb Space Telescope, if you look at pictures of that, is similar. It's got beryllium structured mirrors, but with a gold coating. Okay. 
which provides the best stability and reflectivity in the infrared. Okay. Yep. Um, it's just a, I mean, there's nothing, uh, it's just gold is just the, the best reflector of infrared radiation in the few micron range. Right. Thank you. Um, and that's to do with, you know, the complex um, solid state physics of how gold behaves compared with other other metals. Right. Yeah, thank you. Sir. Um, I don't know. Did I actually? I'm not sure. I just there was a picture of the mirror. It's oh yes, there in the in looking installed, you can see the primary mirror there. And in fact, you can see where the diffraction spikes came from. You see the supports in a cross there. There's a definitely a perpendicular um, support, which is consistent with that diffraction pattern. Yes, nice example. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, wave your hand at me. Uh, Tony Morris. Hi. Uh, in some of the uh, data charts that you showed us, there was uh, Seyfert and ARP objects. Well, they're, right. as I remember, they're relatively near objects. Yeah. Uh, so is there a blend of data that's uh, relatively stable between near ARP objects and more some of the more distant objects that you've observed? Um, yes, I think, if, let's see if I can go. I mean, they, they're really, they were there on those pictures really as a, as a sort of example of things that we knew in order to say where we might find other objects from. You know, so so if, we, if, we, if we identified a wise thing with something that looks more like a particular local example than another, it might tell us about them. Um, and so really the, 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 the highlight was finding examples with wise that didn't look like any of the local templates. Because it, it's a, it's it's the it's the new thing aspect, and that um, partly it's because the local ones and you know things have evolved a lot since we were looking. Wise looked a long way back, and so these things just are less common now. And also, we've only got a relatively small volume near us, so we might not expect to bump into anything in a in a rare class nearby, because there's just not enough nearby volume to see it. And the universe is now different than it was back when when Wise was detecting the things that it's been highlighting here. Um, and so even those unusual objects like the Markarian and ARP objects locally um, are not that unusual. You know, there's hundreds of them in the sky versus thousands of NGC objects. Whereas the, the hot dogs are, you know, there's a thousand of them amongst um, a billion billion galaxies. You know, they are really freaks, and you wouldn't expect to find one nearby because they're very rare, regardless of how things have changed in time. Um, but but the the point of showing those local objects in the picture is to to highlight how different they are, and perhaps to emphasise where we might have found the wise objects if they followed the, the local templates. Okay, thank you. Does that answer? Is that? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Trevor Worrell, uh, you've got a question? Like to unmute? Hi. Yes, so I was just wondering in that um, um, that example of that gold mirror at the back, the primary mirror, were there any means of adjusting the secondary uh, or the receiver, the, the sensor? Should any misalignment have taken place um, during its flight? Did you There's get that? Sorry. Definitely a desire never to have mechanisms which might be crucial. Um, so all the alignment was done to start with on the ground. Um, now, as to whether there was a possibility of, of moving things on orbit, I'm not sure. Um, typically, though, the structures are so you know are tough to survive launch. And so they should be good enough to, to remain where they were put. Um, however, I'm not actually sure 
and certainly in orbit testing is used to check things seem to be aligned and things are performing as they should be. Um, but I, I, I know there's generally a philosophical point that uh, spacecraft designers are very wary of putting in anything which might accidentally move, uh, you know, or may go the wrong way. So um, I think the intention is that everything is tested thoroughly on the ground and then should be right as confirmed uh, to be in to be working and to, to set some parameters for how you handle need to handle the data, but that including object including the opportunity to focus is I think usually weighed against the the risk that it could accidentally be used to defocus. Yeah, thank you. That thanks for that. Uh, well, I'm not uh, I'm not actually sure whether I think my my intuition is that. No, it was tested on the ground and then locked in place um, very, very certainly and then confirmed to be where it should have been in space looking at people. Uh, yeah, thanks. Have we anyone else? Uh, wave your hand at me. Yeah. Tony Morris again is waving. Hi. Uh, on, on the charts, uh, you, you were showing the, the wavelength of the, the emission, but on many of the charts, you also showed the frequency right that's, that's often something we, we don't see in astronomical presentations what, is that particular to wise data well not not particularly it, it's more that often you get frequency coming from people who work at radio wavelengths and so if you're coming a picture covers everything from optical to radio with the interspersed infrared in the middle that's you know where that comes in because okay. people who work in ALMA, ALMA's bands um, are defined in terms of frequency in gigahertz. And everybody who works on that knows that. And yet, infrared astronomers in space give you wavelengths in microns. So it's just to, to tie them together. If you've got the same picture, some people are going to be looking at a part of it expecting to see gigahertz. And some people are going to be looking at a different part expecting to see microns. Okay, so would it would it be fairly safe to assume that if you ever see an image like that again, it it's blended satellite data and radio data? Typically, I mean, I think uh, if if it cover if it covers a large enough range of wavelengths or frequencies that it's going to bump into two different communities, you need to be able to to show their favourite uh, way of expressing things. Um, so, like in in the X ray. You usually get spectra marking killer electron volts, which is again not something which is intuitive um, or familiar to other bands. And so, if you've got that for X ray to optical, you'll usually have a wavelength, at least in the optical part, too, to you know, com compare the two. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm looking around. Uh, any more hands waving? Uh, try the other screen. I've got two screens of people. I can't see anybody else. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we've worked uh, Andrew very hard tonight. And actually, we've got to be very grateful because he stepped in to give this talk at fairly short notice. Uh, when uh, we lost our, our previous speaker so if you'd like to put your hands together and in a, a typical way give him our thanks thank you i hope you uh, i hope it was uh, instructive for you and you uh, perhaps got more of a sense of what wise have been doing i think uh, quite a few people enjoyed that uh, we've got a few th thumbs up from people uh if you'd like to just stop uh, sharing your screen yeah. uh, yeah. and uh, we'll move on to the next okay. part of our meeting you're welcome uh, andrew you're welcome to i think i have to go and get it you can go away uh, break but if you have other questions do feel free to get back in touch i will do uh, i've okay. got your email so people can email me and i can okay. forward them on great thank oh, you okay. i will have a good night thanks andrew